السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله وحده وصلى الله وسلم وبارك على من لا نبي بعده وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين We praise Allah سبحانه وتعالى We thank him for everything he has given us We send blessings and salutations upon Muhammad صلى الله عليه وسلم his entire household and all his companions. May Allah bless them and bless every single one of us and grant us goodness. Brothers and sisters in Islam, this evening we have two very touching stories from amongst the companions of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, that which will bring tears to the eyes. We will start off with that of Amr ibn al-As radiyallahu an. He was a great companion of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the son of one of the great leaders of Quraysh, who had inflicted a lot of harm on the Muslims. His name was Al-As ibn Wa'il. That was the father of Amr ibn Al-As radiallahu an. And as Amr ibn Al-As, who was approximately 18 at the time, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was granted nubuwa. When this young man was growing up, he grew up as one of the elite from the families of those who were the senior of Quraysh. And when Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam declared that Allah was one and that he was the Nabi of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, great enmity arose against him, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And the Muslims were requested or permitted to leave to Africa. And we all know that in Africa, the leader, an Najashi, whose name was Ashama, he was the one who was very just. From amongst those who were sent by Quraysh in order to go to an Najashi, to convince him to send the Muslims back to Mecca was Amr ibn al-As radiallahu an. At that time, he was not yet a believer. So he was young and he was a businessman. He had gone to Abyssinia, to Africa, several times before he had met with some of the leaders, some of the ministers of the Najashi, and he had known them, and there was a lot of exchange of gifts between them and so on, and he pitched up at the court of an Najashi. And we all heard the story when we spoke a few days ago about Ja'far ibn Abi Talib radiallahu an, that this man Amr ibn al-As came with a lot of gifts and he told an Najashi that we want you to send back these people because they are criminals and what they are saying is very bad. So an Najashi says, I want to listen to their side of the story. When he heard their side of the story, he decided to send the gifts back to Amr ibn al-As and he told Amr ibn al-As, even though they had a good relationship, he said, you can go back. I am not an oppressor. I'm going to leave these people here. What they are saying is correct. They can stay here for as long as they want. Subhanallah. So as he was leaving, an Najashi calls him. And this is something we did not make mention of the other day because it is more connected to the story that we are speaking about today. An Najashi calls Amr ibn al-As and he tells Amr ibn al-As, Oh Amr, I'm surprised that such an intelligent man like you I'm surprised that you do not understand the truthful nature of the messenger in your midst. What he is calling you towards is correct. And he is a messenger of Allah. Imagine this is a man in Africa confirming to Amr ibn al-As. He says, this man Muhammad, may peace be upon him, shall take over all his enemies and he will be victorious over them all. So if I were you, I would accept his message. Amr ibn al-As looks at him and says, are you serious? He says, yes, I'm serious. He says, do you accept it? He says, yes, I do. This was a Najashi, subhanallah, the one in Africa. So Amr ibn al-As decided, okay, I'm going. He went. And on the way, obviously, his father is a big shot. And he is also a top person who was sent to bring back these Muslimin from Africa. He failed in his mission. And at the same time, he was unable to go back to tell him, hey, I'm thinking about Islam. But he thought about it hard. Later on, he says, that was the first time in my life that I actually felt the light of Islam in my heart. And I had a feeling in my heart that there is something about the Muslims that we don't know or we are just denying. So the person who first called Amr ibn al-As to Islam was someone in Africa who had not even seen Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa This is amazing. And Amr ibn al-As says that it came to the battle of Badr and the battle of Uhud, I took part in the battle of Uhud on the side of the Mushriks, the people of Mecca. And I was actually leading one of the smaller groups. And in my heart, I felt, you know what? I'm on the wrong side. 
Subhanallah, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us all goodness and ease and make us people whom when we know what is right and wrong, he gives us the ability to follow what is right. And this is why amazingly Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam used to make a dua. Allahumma habib ilayna al-imana wa zayinhu fi qulubina wa karrih ilayna al-kufra wal fusuqa wal isyan. Oh Allah, beautify iman and belief for us and beautify it in our hearts, make us love it and make us detest disbelief and make us hate sin and disobedience. And then he used to say, Allahumma arina al-haqqa haqqan warzuqna tiba'a wa arina al-batila batilan warzuqna jtinaba. Oh Allah, show us what is right to be correct and help us to follow it. There is no point in knowing what is right and not following it and show us what is wrong to be wrong and help us stay away from it. What's the point of saying, I know what I'm doing is wrong, but we keep on doing it until the day we die. So Amr ibn al-As was later granted the strength after Sulh al You know, Hudaybiyah, the treaty that was signed between the Muslims and the Kuffar just outside Mecca al Mukarramah, the year that Muhammad sallallahu had come with his companions to do Umrah and he was blocked. So Amr ibn al-As, after that, he decided, no, 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 I have to go to Medina and I have to become a Muslim. And so quietly he left. And he took his belongings and he was on his way. And guess what happened? On the way, he sees another two men who were just like him. Khalid ibn al-Walid. Subhanallah, radiyallahu an. And Uthman ibn Talha. He sees them and he says, hey, what are you doing? Where are you going? They said, where are you going? He says, no, I want to know where you guys are going. Amr ibn al-As, radiyallahu an. So Khalid ibn al-Walid says, we are going to Muhammad to follow him as the messenger and to follow Islam. We are going to Medina Munawwara. He said, you know what? I'm going to do exactly the same thing. Subhanallah. So they went in together, the three of them. They met Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Khalid ibn al-Walid, Amr ibn al-As, radiyallahu anhum, and Uthman ibn Talha. So th- when they had gone and pledged their Islam and Iman, declared it, Amr ibn al-As was also one of those who said, oh messenger, I'm worried about what I've done in the past. I went to Abyssinia, to Africa, to try and send the people back. And I've done so much in the battles against the Muslims. So the Prophet ﷺ repeated and reiterated, Ya Amr, Inna al-Islam ayajubbu ma qabla. Oh Amr, Islam will delete the sins you have committed before you have reverted or turned to Islam. So that is when he was quite happy. Now he became a major leader amongst the Muslims, Amr ibn al-As. He was a military man just like Khalid ibn al-Walid. Perhaps not as strong, but... He was very, very intelligent. He too had served Islam in such a big way that whenever you hear about Palestine and you hear about Asham and you hear about Egypt, you need to remember the name Amr ibn al-As. He was the main leader who was involved in the conquest of Palestine and the conquest of Egypt. He was the man. What had happened, as you have heard a few days ago, the, the messenger of Muhammad wasallam was killed by the Romans. He was killed by those who fell under the governorate of the Romans. And when this happened, the Prophet ﷺ prepared a whole army to fight them. To fight who? To fight the Romans. They were the rulers at the time. They had colonized the whole area. And so that war did not just end in one go. It carried on and on. Wherever the Romans were, the Muslims carried on. And they defeated the Romans one after the other. City after city was coming under the control of the Muslimin. Where did it all start? It started because they asked for trouble by killing one of the Muslim ambassadors who was sent to them. Just with a message to say, accept this deen. Had they wanted, they would have sent him back to say, we're not accepting it. But they killed him. So much so that Amr ibn al-As himself says that it happened with me. You know what happened with him? One of the instances, one of the leaders of the kuffar decided, no, we, we, we need to tackle this army in a different way. They are getting city after city, town after town. The way we must tackle them, call them and let's have a meeting. So they decided to send a messenger to the Muslimin to say, we want to speak with one of you guys, the important one from amongst you, and so on. Amr ibn al-As radiallahu anhu decided, forget about sending someone else who's important. I will go as the leader. I will go. But he did not tell them that he was the leader who was coming to them. They thought perhaps it's one of the, the big shots, but they didn't know it's the main man. Subhanallah. So Amr ibn al-As radiallahu anhu went into the palace of the leader of the other side. And as he entered, they sat, they had beautiful discussions of how they will hand over to the Muslimin and they will do this and they will do that and everything was happening. Meanwhile, that leader, 
he was a traitor. He said, you know what? He told his men when he is walking out, throw the rock from the top and make sure he is executed. Make sure he's gone. They said, okay. So Amr ibn al-As was very intelligent. One of the most intelligent of the lot. He was known for his wit and his in intellect. As he's walking out, he notices movement at the top. Immediately he turned around, he went back to the leader. He says, hey, you know what? I've got with me companions of Muhammad sallallahu who make decisions, military decisions. They are the top people. They are the ones who are with the wars and they are the ones who are part of the conquest, winning all the time. They are the main guys. I'd suggest that I bring them in so you can tell them what you told me and you can actually see them yourself. So the leader thought about it and he thought to himself, okay, I was about to eradicate one man. I'd rather eradicate all 10 that he's talking about. So he looks at him and he says, okay, bring them along. So he said, okay, let me go. So he sent a message to his people. Hey, don't kill him. Change of plan. We're going to kill all of them when they come. Meanwhile, Amr ibn al-As went out and he never came back. But how did he come back? The whole army came back. Later on, the whole place was conquered, subhanallah. And when that leader happened to now see Amr ibn al-As as the leader of the Muslimin, he says, oh, it's you. He says, yes, and it was you, wasn't it? You were planning things. He says, yes, we were. And then that is how we now know the story because he confessed to his plan and so on. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us. This is the intellect of Amr ibn al-As radiallahu anhu. So much so that when he was conquering Asham one after the other, when he got to Al-Quds, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala free Al-Quds for us, the Muslimin. When he got to Al-Quds, do you know what happened? The leaders told him, and they, it was under the Christians, they told him, they said, look, we being under the Romans here, we are not going to fight you. Rather, we will give it to you. But we want your leader, the Khalifa of the Muslims to come through. If he comes, we'll give him the keys and he can sign the agreement himself. Amr ibn al-As saw that, you know what, we've got a solid army here. And you know what? It's okay. Let's call Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu anhu. So they actually sent a message to Medina Munawwara and Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu anhu arrived in Al-Quds and he came himself. And that is when they handed the keys to him, Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu anhu. And this is the same day they saw the Muslimin were not interested in women. They saw that they were very united. They saw that the Salatul Fajr was completely full. They were reading Salah, nobody missing at all. And they saw that the leader was just like the lead. They were very just. Everyone was equal. And the same day that they gave the keys, it is reported they had a meeting. How to get the place back. Turn these people away from their deen and their religion. Get them involved with women. Haram in a haram way, obviously. Let them fight amongst each other so their disunity is lost. And let them turn away from their prayer. Because the day their prayer will be filled like this, we have no chance. We will never have a chance to overcome people whose conviction is so strong. And this is why we find today it's no longer in our hands. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us the ability to unite. May he grant us the ability to turn to him in prayer. Even the enemy knows the power of the prayer. And Salatul Fajr, Salatul Isha, and these prayers, when we as Muslimin don't know the power of these prayers. So this was Amr ibn al-As radiallahu anhu. With Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu anhu, we're going to mention this a little bit later when we get to the next companion. But Amr ibn al-As, then he proceeded further and he started con the conquest of Egypt. And he wanted to get it out of the hands of the Romans. So he had several meetings with the Coptics. And he told them, O Coptics, our messenger has told us that when we conquer Egypt, we should be kind to you because you are related to us through, subhanallah, Ismail. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless us. How are they related? The mother of Ismail was from amongst the Coptics, according to some narrations. Hajar alayha salatu was salam. And so they were surprised. The Coptics, they, they said, subhanallah, it's only a messenger of Allah that can take a relationship back so many generations and say, be kind to them. And this is why a lot of the Coptics had sided with the Muslimin. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us the ability to be kind even to the non-Muslims. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us today. People sit and say these non-Muslims are all our enemies. We don't know and we didn't understand the history of Islam. Islam only looked at those who fought us as people who needed to be tackled. 
the rest of them, subhanallah, they are innocent people who are waiting for us to deliver the message to them so that they can accept the message just like our forefathers accepted the message so that today we are sitting as Muslimin. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala strengthen us and guide us. Never let the desperation in your heart make you lose track of what is right and wrong. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us. So Amr ibn al-As, when he was entering Egypt, just before he entered, Uthman ibn Affan radiallahu anhu goes to Amir al-Mu'minin Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu anhu and says, Oh Umar, I fear that Amr ibn al-As is conquering city after city, town after town. Perhaps he is overdoing it and perhaps he is now doing it just because he enjoys it. Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu anhu was a man who was very straight. He wrote a letter straight to Amr ibn al-As radiallahu anhu. He says, look, if you get my letter and you have not entered Egypt, come back to Medina. But if you have entered, Bismillah, you can carry on. So Amr ibn al-As, he knew that there's a message coming to me. And he was aware of what had happened. So he was still in a sham, in a place known as Rafah, according to some narrations. I'm sure we've heard that. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect the people of Rafah today. And so what happened is, he, he kept that messenger away for a few days until they entered the first part of Egypt. Then he said, where's the messenger? Bring him along. Where's the letter? Bring it. Let's read it. He read it in front of the Muslimin. And he told the Muslims, where are we? They said, we are in Egypt. Okay, let's carry on. Bismillah. Mashallah. And they conquered Egypt and they sent message to Medina Munawwara. And this all happened at the time of Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu an. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to grant us ease and goodness and strength. And wallahi, they lived under the Muslims in the most peaceful manner. Justice for the Jewish people, justice for the Christians, justice for the Muslims, and even for those who followed other faiths. They all lived in so much of harmony because there was a lot of justice and there was tolerance of people who were belonging to other faiths, even though these were the Sahaba of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Where are we today where people are preaching a different type of Islam from that which the Sahaba radiallahu anhum lived upon? My brothers and sisters, it's important for us to take note of this. And it's important for us as much as we are desperate to solve the problems of the ummah, but we will never be able to solve them via injustice. It will only be the way that it solved the matter right at the beginning. Bring those solutions back. They will solve the matter here. May Allah correct us all and strengthen us. So Amr ibn al-As radiallahu anhu, so much had happened. And it was, it's amazing how one day he was sitting and the people, some of them did not like him because of his conquests and so on. They wanted to embarrass him. So one man tells another man, I'll pay you if you can embarrass this man. How to embarrass him? You know, his mother was a slave girl. And that was the truth. So ask him in public, who was your mother? Oh, Amir al-Mu'minin. Oh, he was not Amir al-Mu'minin, but the Amir of the Jaish, the Amir of the army. And I'll pay you. So a man gets up in front of everyone and says, we want to know who was the mother of the Amir. Amr ibn al-As knew exactly what happened. So do you know what he says? He says, my mother was a slave girl. She was a free woman who was taken slave, bought by Abdullah ibn Jad'an, given as a gift to Al-As ibn Wa'il, who happens to be my father. Now, the man who was jealous about it and told you he would pay you, go and get the money from him. Subhanallah. Subhanallah. Straight to the point. This was Amr ibn al-As. He knew that someone must have told this man that I'll pay you some money, go and cause mischief. But he was proud of his lineage, no matter what. And he made mention of it. Amr ibn al-As, at the time of his death, in the year 43 Hijri, he passed away in Egypt. At the time of his death, subhanallah, there was something that happened. And what was it? He was worried because he was also involved in witnessing what happened amongst the companions of Muhammad sallallahu in terms of dispute and war. And some people were blaming him as well. So he says, you know, I passed through three levels in my life. I was a disbeliever at one stage. Had I died at that time, I had no hope. I had just accepted Islam and with Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa had I died at that stage, there was a lot of hope. Today, after I have seen a lot of power and authority and so much that has happened, I don't know my deeds. Some of them are for me and some of them are against me. I only have hope in the mercy of Allah and there is nothing else that I can have. May Allah grant me forgiveness. Then he says his famous statement, Oh Allah, you instructed us, but we disobeyed. And Oh Allah, you prohibited us, but we did not take heed. And Oh Allah, I am now at my deathbed. I have no option but to hope in your mercy. So forgive me because you are most merciful, most forgiving. Subhanallah. And then he says, Oh Allah, I am not strong in front of you. I can never win. I am... Not, I am 
not innocent, so I cannot excuse myself, meaning the sins I've committed, I'm admitting. But oh Allah, I am not a proud person. I have come here, Ya Allah, on my deathbed, seeking forgiveness from you. So forgive me, O oh most merciful. And it is reported that he passed away with La ilaha illallah, Muhammadur Rasulullah, on his tongue. May Allah grant that to us, because Muhammad sallallahu says, Man kana akhiru kalamihi min dunya la ilaha illallah, dakhal al-jannah. Whoever's last statements as they leave the world are La ilaha illallah Muhammadur Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, they will enter Jannah. May Allah grant that to us. Our next hero, arguably the most famous from amongst all the Sahaba. Who is that? The most famous. You ask a little child, who was Bilal? He will tell you the Mu'addin of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Bilal ibn Rabah. He was an Abyssinian, an African man from Africa. Subhanallah. His lineage goes back to Africa. Today, every Muslim child beyond the age of five, including the bulk of us, I think we would know. The minute you say, who was Bilal? Two things we know about him. He was the Mu'addin of Muhammad sallallahu And he suffered a lot at the hands of Quraysh. And he used to say, Ahadun Ahad. He is one. He is one. Allah is one. Allah is one. That's it. Don't we know the most about Bilal ibn Rabah? You ask anyone, they know. So this is why he is known as the most famous. From amongst the Muslimin, the Sahaba radiallahu anhum, in the midst of the Muslims. Bilal ibn Rabah, he was approximately 10 years younger than Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa His father was Rabah and his mother was a slave girl from Africa. And her name was Hamama, according to some of the narrations. He was a person whom... It is said that he was a slave initially of Abdullah ibn Jad'an. And one day he heard, you know, he used to hear him and his friends talking about Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa One of them was Umayyah bin Khalaf. And they used to swear in their hearts that we know what Muhammad is saying is the truth. He's an honest man. He's trustworthy. But you know what? If we have to accuse him of being a liar and a magician and a womanizer and a power greedy man, we will do that. And Bilal ibn Rabah used to work there and he used to hear this. And this was in the first few days of Islam. And he used to go out with some of the sheep in, and some of the animals and cattle in order to graze them just on the outskirts of Mecca. And one day, just a few days later, he saw Muhammad ibn Abdullah sallallahu alayhi wa and Abu Bakr as-Siddiq radiallahu anhu in one of the caves just out in the outskirts of Mecca whilst he was busy with his sheep. So Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, Oh shepherd, we would like from, your, from the milk of your sheep. So Bilal ibn Rabah says, these sheep are not mine, but one I'm allowed to drink from and I can. So if you want, I can let you drink my share because this will not give us much milk. Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa says, bring it here. They brought it and Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa with his blessed hands decided to milk that animal. There was enough milk for Bilal ibn Rabah to drink. He milked it again. Abu Bakr as-Siddiq radiallahu anhu drank. Milked it again. Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam drank. And Bilal ibn Rabah came back for two, three days. And all those sheep started looking big. They gave a lot of milk. So Abu Jahal, he knew that there's something going on here. So he tells Abdullah ibn Jad'an that, you know what? Your slave boy is definitely meeting Muhammad somewhere. Because this doesn't happen to anyone. It has to be that magician. Astaghfirullah. Look at them saying magician. So now they, f they followed him and they found that yes, it is the truth. In fact, what they did is they blocked him that the next day. They stopped it happening. And Bilal ibn Rabah declared his shahada. It was known. When he declared his shahada, they started beating him up so much. Abdullah ibn Jad'an gave him away to Umayyah bin Khalaf according to some narrations. Other narrations say no, he actually belonged to some people who had then written him off to Umayyah bin Khalaf. Somehow he ended up in the hands of Umayyah bin Khalaf. So now his boss was Umayyah bin Khalaf. They decided to harm him. The worst ever. What they did, they used to strip him of his clothing, drag him in the heat, take him, burn him with fire, whip him. And they treated him worse than an animal. They tied him at his neck and they pulled him around and gave him to the children to spit on him, to swear him, just because he was a man from Africa. And this is what they did to him. And they said, we want you to swear Muhammad and to praise our gods. And he had a beautiful voice. Bilal ibn Rabah, beautiful voice. And he kept on saying, Ahadun Ahad, Ahadun Ahad, Ahadun Ahad. He is one, he is one. They, he saw that the others have already said, okay, you know, like we heard about Ammar ibn Yasir and the others. 
They were given permission. Okay, if they are harming you so much, you can say with your tongue what is not in your heart. Bilal says, I can't do that. I can take what they're doing to me. It's okay. But I won't insult Allah. I don't mind dying in this condition. And he carried on ahadun ahad. So much so that one day when he was just bone and blood was left on his body. Abu Bakr as-Siddiq radiallahu anhu tells Umayyah bin Khalaf, why don't you sell me this man? I'll pay for him. So they started talking about the deal. No one wanted him because who would want him in that condition? He was a man that according to Quraysh was worth nothing. But according to Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he was the man, subhanallah, you know, enduring for the sake of Allah. So Bilal ibn Rabah, as weak as he had become, Abu Bakr as-Siddiq radiallahu anhu struck a deal for nine ounces of gold. And that was a lot. That was a lot. But the deal was struck. He got the money and Bilal ibn Rabah was taken under Abu Bakr as-Siddiq radiallahu anhu's ownership. And then Umayyah bin Khalaf tells Abu Bakr in front of everyone that, you know, even if you offered me one ounce, I would have given it because this guy is worth nothing. Immediately, Abu Bakr as-Siddiq realized that they've insulted Bilal ibn Rabah radiallahu anhu. So Abu Bakr says, Wallahi, if you had asked me for 100 ounces, I would have paid them. Amazing. So this one is saying, had you asked me for one, I would have given it. And he says, had you asked me for 100, I would have given them. That's the value we can never attach to this man, Bilal ibn Rabah. So Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam looks at Abu Bakr as-Siddiq radiallahu anhu when he heard the news. And he says, let's go half half here. Abu Bakr as-Siddiq radiallahu anhu says, oh messenger, I have, so, I have already freed him for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is how Bilal ibn Rabah was saved. And amazingly, subhanallah, when they made hijrah to Medina Munawwara, Bilal ibn Rabah radiallahu an, something amazing happened to him. When the adhan was instructed by Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa you know the wording we have it to this day, Bilal ibn Rabah was the one who was called upon to, to climb up a certain place, a rooftop, and he was told, you call out the adhan because your voice is clearer and better and it has a sweetness in it. So my brothers and sisters, when we are choosing mu'addineen for our masajid, choose someone who has a good voice, clear and a sweet voice that can attract people to the salah. So Bilal ibn Rabah got up and he called out the adhan. Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. To this day we hear it, may Allah grant us goodness. That was Bilal ibn Rabah. And he became known as the Mu'addin of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa And he had an assistant. His assistant was known as Abdullah ibn Ummi Maktoum radiallahu anhu. And we've already spoken about him. So Bilal ibn Rabah, he was given so much value. They respected him so much. Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa used to say that أَطْوَلُ النَّاسِ أَعْنَاقًا يَوْمَ الْقِيَامَةِ المؤذنون. The most conspicuous people on the day of judgment will be those who were Mu'addin. The callers to Salah because they get the reward for everyone who came to the prayer thereafter. And then he says also, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, regarding Bilal ibn Rabah, when Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam came back from Mi'raj, the ascension into heaven, he says, Oh Bilal, I heard your footsteps in paradise. Subhanallah. And this was good news. Bilal ibn Rabah used to tremble. And he used to wonder, subhanallah, Allah has blessed me so much. I was a slave. I was from Africa. And Islam has made me one of the most important people ever. Here I am walking with Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa my head very high. And I am one of his closest chaperons, subhanallah. This was Bilal ibn Rabah. When An-Najashi sent three little spears, very important small spears, as a gift to Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa he kept one. He gave one to Ali ibn Abi Talib radiallahu anhu, one to Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu anhu, and the one he kept, he gave it to Bilal ibn Rabah to hold for him at all times. So Bilal ibn Rabah radiallahu anhu used to put it in front of him when he used to read salah elsewhere. And they used to use it as a sutra. Sutra meaning something to put in front of you for salah. So that when people cross, they wouldn't be crossing you. They would, they would be a barrier between you and them. And this was Bilal ibn Rabah radiallahu anhu. Amazing man. They asked him, how come your footsteps were heard in paradise? Later on, they found that whenever he made wudu, he never used to allow that wudu to break before having read some prayer with that wudu. Meaning ablution. When he washes himself, he made sure he prays almost immediately. May Allah grant us that dedication of Bilal ibn Rabah radiallahu anhu. Now let's listen to what happened in the battle of Badr. The Prophet sallallahu calls his companions and tells them, the war cry, the war cry, meaning you, you need to repeat a statement often as we are entering Badr. What will it be? Ahadun ahad, ahadun ahad, the same cry of Bilal ibn Rabah. You know, to this day, we put our finger up 
that finger is depicting that there is none worthy of worship besides Allah. It means we are Muslimin following that of Bilal ibn Rabah radiallahu an, and it, it has become known as the finger of Shahada taught by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That way we bear witness there is one God, subhanallah, the maker. So they got into the battle of Badr. Umayyah bin Khalaf did not want to participate in the battle of Badr. But Uqba ibn Abi Mu'ayyit was a man whom at the early days of Islam, he used to tell Umayyah bin Khalaf, hit Bilal, torture him, do this to him, do that to him, now drag him, now burn him. Who used to, who used to encourage him? Uqba ibn Abi Mu'ayyit used to encourage Umayyah bin Khalaf and tell him what to do to Bilal. So Umayyah bin Khalaf did not want to come to Badr. But Uqba ibn Abi Mu'ayyit told him, you know what? You're a woman. How can you not come to Badr? He got so angry. He said, okay, I'm coming. So Uqba ibn Abi Mu'ayyit encouraged him to come to the battle of Badr only to be sought revenge. Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. What happened is when he came into the battle, Umayyah bin Khalaf heard the, the army saying, Ahadun Ahad, Ahadun Ahad. And immediately it, bring, it, it brought back memories to say, I used to hear Bilal say this. And now the whole army is saying this. And they're all here. And everyone's here to seek revenge for what we've done. Next thing before we knew it, he was already executed and everything had happened. Umayyah bin Khalaf saw Bilal ibn Rabah. The matter was sorted. Uqba ibn Abi Mu'ayyit also lost his life. What they did to Bilal, they didn't even taste a little portion of it. Rather, they were executed because of what they did. The crimes that they had perpetrated. So this was Umayyah bin Khalaf. Bilal ibn Rabah radiallahu anhu, the conquest of Makkah came in. And three people entered the Kaaba with Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Uthman ibn Talha, Usama bin Zayd, and Bilal ibn Rabah radiallahu anhu. And the kuffar, the leaders of Makkah were, were watching. They were looking. Wow, that slave from Africa is the main man with Muhammad today. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. We can't believe this. Some of them were still non-Muslim. So they said, Luckily, my father died before he saw this day. The other man says, I can't really digest what I'm seeing here. I, I don't know what's wrong with these people. Are these the same people whom we drove out of their homes? Today, they have come back here with thousands of men. And look at this man. He's a black African, straight from Africa. And he's one of the most important people. And he is standing here in the Kaaba, one of four, top four, subhanallah. So Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam told Bilal, Bilal, it's the time for prayer. Climb right on top of the Kaaba and call out the Adhan. For the first time, Bilal ibn Rabah got on top of the Kaaba. And the Kuffar of Quraysh are watching. Abu Sufyan is watching. He had just accepted Islam. But the others who were still not Muslim are watching. And Bilal ibn Rabah says, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. And, and the guys are shocked. Wow. You mean this man? And people started commenting. So Abu Sufyan says, I'm not commenting because you know the grains of sand in front of me will inform Muhammad what we are talking about. So you guys better keep quiet. And Muhammad sallallahu came out of the Kaaba and told them, I heard what you were saying. I've been told. So Abu Sufyan says, didn't I tell you? The two of them who were there immediately declared, you are a messenger of Allah. So the Prophet sallallahu made a famous statement that look, Islam is free from racism. All people are from Adam and Adam was from dust. This man Bilal ibn Rabah, Allah has raised him higher than all of you. He is a man from paradise. So Bilal ibn Rabah was one of those who was already told in his life, you are from paradise. Yet he was a slave boy at one stage from Africa. Islam freed him just like it freed so many others who were enslaved by the kuffar of Quraysh. Subhanallah. So this was Bilal ibn Rabah radiallahu an. It is reported that at the time of the death of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the body was not yet buried. The blessed body of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa was not yet buried. And the time of salah came in. So Bilal ibn Rabah had got up in order to call the adhan. And he started calling the adhan. And when he got to, Ashhadu anna Muhammad Rasulullah. He was unable to utter those words. He stopped. He choked. He cried and all the companions burst out crying. Here is Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. We bear witness that he is the messenger. Bilal ibn Rabah, the most beautiful voice. The voice that when people heard it, they wanted to come for prayer. He could not say this anymore because he was so much in love with Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He says, I was a slave boy and I used to be so 
engrossed in my thoughts. Islam came and saved me and made me from amongst the most noble and honored. And here I am, the man who came with the message. I am calling out his name. He just choked. He couldn't carry on. So at the time of Abu Bakr as-Siddiq radiallahu an, Bilal ibn Rabah excused himself. He says, Ya Abu Bakr, I cannot call this adhan out. A few days he tried. Every time he would cry and break down profusely when he got to Ashhadu Anna Muhammad al-Rasulullah. So what happened, Bilal? According to some narrations, Abu Bakr as-Siddiq radiallahu anhu allowed him, excused him. He went up to Asham. He went up to the Palestinian region and he passed away. He is buried in Dimashq. But at the same time, there is... There are two things that we need to know about Bilal ibn Rabah radiallahu anhu. In the 15th year of Hijrah, Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu anhu came up in order to get the keys of Jerusalem. And what happened? The Sahaba radiallahu anhu told him, convince Bilal. He has never called Adhan after Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa Convince him to call the Adhan. So Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu anhu told him, you know, you are our leader. And you, you have been freed by our leader Abu Bakr as-Siddiq radiallahu anhu. We'd like you to call the adhan out once. They convinced him. He got up to call the adhan. Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. And they burst out crying. Because it brought back memories of Medina, Munawwara. Memories of the days of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Bilal ibn Rabah, the muaddin of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. The first time after so many years in the presence of Umar ibn al-Khattab, he calls out the adhan in Asham. And it was something that shook them. Their hair stood. And they really wept so much. They cried, subhanallah. When Bilal ibn Rabah went to get married, he was married more than once. But when he went to marry him and his brother, they went forth to meet the father of these two girls. And you know, they were from Africa. They were dark in complexion. And they had gone forth. And do you know how they made the proposal? Very interesting. They said, I am Bilal. This is my brother. We were slaves from Africa and Islam has freed us. We were downtrodden and Islam has raised our rank. We are who you know we are. If you allow us to marry your daughters, alhamdulillah. And if you do not allow us, Allahu Akbar. They, they gave them the daughters, said, Bismillah, you are people of Jannah, Allahu Akbar. Bilal ibn Rabah himself was a person of Jannah, so much so, there is one narration that says Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa was approached by a man who says, you know, I've got a daughter, if there is anyone good you have in mind, please let us know. So he says, Bilal ibn Rabah. Now that was something because obviously he's a man from Africa. Look at how racism was chopped by Islam. So the man went back, he came after some time, he says, if you have anyone in mind, he says, I told you Bilal ibn Rabah. So... He went back again. The third time he came, he says, Oh, messenger, you know, if there's someone you have in mind, he says, What is wrong? Bilal ibn Rabah, you don't want your daughter to marry a man from paradise? And that is when he gave his daughter and they became such a happy couple. Subhanallah. Brothers and sisters, let us take a lesson from this. Today, when we get people married, the first thing we look at, we say, He's not from my tribe. He doesn't come from my clan. He's not my this, he's not my that, he's not wealthy enough. Like we said a few days ago, he doesn't have a car or a house or a stable job. I can't give my daughter. Wallahi, if he's a good man, responsible, and he has values of Iman and Islam, good character and conduct, by you saying no, you are following those of the people of ignorance who used to deny the marriage of their daughters to brilliant people. And I want to end really saying something touching. There are so many of our girls and women and sisters who are unmarried, because their fathers and brothers are the criminals who have not allowed them to get married when good proposals came in or when people had to come forth, they denied and they showed no interest and they blocked and they turned away, not realizing, Wallahi, my brother, Wallahi, beloved father, you have really committed a grave injustice against your daughter or your sister or the lady who is under your guardianship by not getting her married. Wallahi, there are so many of our sisters who are weeping solely because the men folk are unreasonable. So much so, the non-Muslims around us actually think that Islam is barbaric where a Muslim woman has no choice and nothing to say. Wallahi, that is utter sheer nonsense. What Islam really teaches, we are sometimes not ready to follow. And then we want to call ourselves Muslimin.
Let's be ashamed of ourselves. Inshallah, we hope and we pray that these few words of encouragement can help us to reach out to our own family members, help getting them married, facilitate the marriage. It might not be the best of people, but at least it is a decent human being who believes in Allah and His Messenger. May Allah make it easy for those who are not married to get spouses who will be the coolness of their eyes and for all of us who've been an obstacle in the marriages of our sisters and daughters and others may Allah make it easy for us to digest what is written in their destiny and not to be an obstacle that who will go down in history as a person who has blocked something for those who are under our guardianship may Allah correct us wa sallallahu wa sallam wa baraka ala nabina muhammad subhanallah wa bihamdih subhanakallahumma wa bihamdika nashhadu an la ilaha illa ant nastaghfiruka wa natubu ilayk